Did someone say the title of this talk was using math in daily life? <laughs> okay, actually, by the way, if you want to know what happened, um, tip, because sometimes you might try to do these kinds of things too. The tip is that uh, if you're doing a stream to YouTube and you're streaming the sound that plays on your computer, actually, if you're curious, I'll tell you what happened, right? They're doing what is a very good idea, which is to stream to YouTube. And the way they streamed to YouTube is that they had a computer which had Zoom, and that computer was listening to the, the Zoom signal, if that makes sense. So the Zoom signal was going in, so the sound signal was going in, and they had a setting saying, all of the sound that's playing, send that sound to YouTube. Does it make sense? It's a great idea, right? You just have the Zoom, you have a Zoom open, and then uh, there's the sound from the Zoom coming from here. The way they're doing the whole projection is that my computer is sending a Zoom feed to his computer. Okay, and he had a setting saying, everything that my computer plays normally, send that sound to YouTube. And just to make sure it worked, he also had uh, the YouTube page open to watch the live stream. What happens? Then the YouTube plays the live stream, which goes back into the system, and then you have this, right? And again, by the way, I have had this happen to me before. That's, that's why I, I, I was able to find this. It's not, like it's, a, it's not like it's some dumb mistake or anything. It's that there's a really complicated setup in this room, as you just saw. We went and traced the whole thing, but it works now. We're good, right? Oh, yes, okay. And you also move this thing, which is good, because you see, when I give a talk, I like to be able to be centered. So thanks for moving that too. All right, now back to the story. Uh, the story is about something that happened uh, three years ago. Uh, as, as, as maybe that wasn't heard in the YouTube, so I'll say again. What happened was three years ago, um, well, this ended up in the, in the New York Times uh, about finding a simpler way to teach quadratic equations. And what I learned from that is that uh, you get into the New York Times for math when the math is not too hard to understand. Okay? But at the same time, this was interesting because it caused, the, uh, it caused the article to get shared around a lot. And it reached the point where even the Prime Minister of Singapore posted about it on his social media. I found that very surprising because I didn't realize that there was a leader of a country who would post about this on social media. You see, at that time, that was December of 2019. At that time, the President of the United States was also a very active social media user. His name was Donald. Not sure if you've heard of this guy. Yeah. Uh, actually, apparently, his, his Twitter account has been unbanned, too, recently. But in any case, uh, in any case the, he, he was a very active social media user, but he never, the, the president of the United States, never posted about quadratic equations. So I, I became quite curious, who is the prime minister of Singapore? I didn't know much about Singapore's uh, politicians because I didn't live there. All, all that I knew was my parents had grown up in Singapore, and I was born and grew up in the US. So I started Googling to go and find out more about this Prime Minister of Singapore. Do you know what he studied in university? Math, how do you know? <laughs> oh, or else I wouldn't have asked you the question, right? Yeah, yeah, I see people nodding. Right, you guys are very good. So, so yeah, he studied math. Furthermore, the college he went to was Cambridge. That's a tough place to study math. And in Cambridge, if you study math, then at the end, they rank all of the people. And his rank in the math was number one. Whoa, that's hard. Cambridge has a lot of people who are very good at math. And he was the best of all of them. Actually, I also went to Cambridge to study math, the same program many years later. I didn't manage to rank number one. There's only one of them. Right? So I want to emphasize, the Prime Minister of Singapore is a math genius. Maybe that's why Singapore kind of works. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, continuing on here, I, I guess I should be careful. I wasn't trying to make political statements in this talk uh, at all, at all. I wasn't actually trying. Oh, no. <laughs> 
that, that was not the intention by any means. But, but um, I was simply commenting that people with math background can sort of think about any problem and figure out what's going on. But anyway, so uh, I, I actually stopped thinking about the Prime Minister of Singapore and quadratic equations very soon after, though. Because all of that happened end of 2019. And then this article even, that article was from uh, February of 2020. But then by March of 2020, I started thinking about something else. Can you imagine what could possibly have caused me to change my focus to something else in March of 2020? COVID, COVID, yes. Maybe, maybe you also changed your thought process to something else in March of 2020. Yeah, so that was, uh, that, that, was, that was because, unfortunately, the whole world was shutting down. It, it felt very strange. Uh, where I lived, suddenly, one day, actually, in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the police even said, we, we will have no more people driving around. Uh, we're, we're closing down. Don't, don't drive around. And it was quite eerie, you know, you sort of see some police cars. And after a while, I think they didn't keep closing down, but there was really nobody on the streets, even though you could drive around. It was amazing. Because occasionally, when you did need to drive around, there was no traffic. Couldn't believe it. Did you guys experience that too? Yes. Like, wow. Uh, like, the, the whole place shut down. And, I, and it was a, quite a hopeless period also. I don't know if anyone else felt, like, powerless, hopeless, like, what are we going to do, this, this whole world, big problem. Well, for me, I, I was inspired to do something about it because I also am a Hertz Foundation fellow. The Hertz Foundation is an organization in the U.S. where they find about 15 people every year who are about to start their PhDs in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And they find these 15 people by having students apply from all over the country and then having an extensive interview process to go and pick these 15 people who hopefully are good at the science, technology, engineering, and math. If you get picked, you get a scholarship for five years for your PhD, so you don't have to worry about anything. But then you only have one requirement. There's a moral commitment that if there is ever a moment of national emergency, you'll come to help. The thought process was to have a group of scientists so that if you ever need to, then you can do something. I'm actually one of these people. So I got picked in 2004. Uh, and so I'm sort of on call, if that makes sense. Actually, I, I also now pick these, help pick these people too. In fact, tonight, at around 1 a.m., 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., I'll be interviewing several of the candidates who are applying for this year's cohort. Uh, it's 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and 3 a.m., not because we want to make them suffer, but because we don't want to make them suffer. They're in the United States. Right. So, so basically, the, the, the way that this works is we, by the way, if you can tell, we take this very seriously. Because this is a matter of building up this cohort that if you ever have some major problem, you can have some pretty good scientists uh, available. Well, what happened was when the pandemic exploded uh, in March 2020, a bunch of us got rallied. We, we got an email message from, from somebody highly, highly respected inside this community. And that email message had some information, some scientific information about COVID, which I didn't know before. This is March 2020. This is early in, even in the knowledge space, right? So we found some information. And this person very strongly, in a very long message, encouraged us. This is not just a national emergency. This is an international emergency. If you can have any ideas, you should go and do something about this. We have a moral commitment, remember? This is the time. This is the time. The message went on to say something, something like, what will you tell your grandkids that you did during the great pandemic? Okay, when you get a message like that, you think about what you should do, especially when the guy who sent the message is also pretty distinguished. He has the world record for the most number of patents ever issued to anybody. This guy's pretty interesting. If you, want, if you want to learn more about him, there's a very colorful article about him. His name is Lowell Wood. Uh, and if you look around on Google, you'll find out that there's a 
very long article. The headline of the article is by, it's by a journalist. The journalist called the headline, How an F Student Went On to Become America's Most Prolific Inventor. The subtitle says, and helped bring down the Soviet Union. <laughs> you could imagine this is probably a pretty interesting person. By the way, the F student part, I think that was a stretch by the journalist. The guy's not really an F student. However, the point is that, uh, yeah, interesting person reached out. Oh, wow. So then I thought I should probably do something. But there's only one problem. Remember I said this Hertz Foundation tries to find people in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to come to the aid if there's a moment of emergency. You see, most of the other people, like almost all of the other people, actually do something useful. What am I supposed to do? I do math. Actually, whenever we went to those meetings, uh, there, there are these meetings, conferences of the Hertz Fellows, where you come together every year or so, and they give you name tags, like you know, name, what you do, so-and-so biology, so-and-so electrical engineering. Mine always said Po Shen Lo, pure mathematics. They put the word pure there. <laughs> so I was always thinking, you know, I think I'm the odd one out here, everyone else in this room. You know, normally I go to these events and everyone else in this room, you know, do something, do something. Pure mathematics. I'm the pure mathematics guy. So I was thinking, you know, I was probably the mistake. Why did they give the scholarship to me anyway, right? But then I thought I should, I need to redeem myself. I need to redeem myself. So I started thinking, what can I do? And I finally got an idea on the second day. It was because I was helping to review the PhD thesis of my student. I had a PhD student. He was graduating. When you graduate with a PhD, you write a long Thesis, it's a big, long thing saying here are the things that the person has done. It's pretty long. It's like five years of work, right? And you always give the PhD thesis to your PhD advisor to look at. The real reason you do that is to make sure that there's at least one other person in the world who has ever read your thesis. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of you are PhD students, but yes, the PhD thesis, by the way, is very important. Your committee will also read it. There's a PhD thesis committee, right, that will evaluate it. They will definitely read the first page, the last page. They'll read the acknowledgments. Make sure you acknowledge your PhD thesis committee. Uh, and in the references, if they've done any of the work, uh, you know, you, you, you make sure you have that too. And also, by the way, the beginning of every section because that's how, by the way, the other people evaluate. Is there something going on here? Okay, I'm, I'm half joking. Some people will actually go and read much, much more in your thesis, but I'm telling you the most important parts, right? When you write a PhD thesis, these are the most important parts. Okay, uh, so, so I, I was supposed to read this thing. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to read more than one sentence because I was thinking, how do I do something about pandemics? And the first sentence of the chapter I was reading said something about graph theory. See, the area of math I work in is something called graph theory. Graph theory is translated into network theory by normal people. And pe people who think about graphs and networks just think about things connected to things, connected to things, connected to things, connected to things. And that's just how our life is. We just, we people who think about network theory look at the world and just see networks. All right. And it occurred to me, network theory, pandemics, spread, Spread, disease spreads on a network. Oh, maybe I can try to think about networks. The next thing that popped into my head was, wait, how do you get a network? This is the first pandemic that there are smartphones. This is what was flashing through my head. This is the first pandemic that there are smartphones. Maybe you can use smartphones to build an anonymous network. Maybe you can use the network to control the disease. This is the initial idea that flashed into my head. And then I was lucky, I work at a university where we have a lot of very good computer programmers, computer scientists, Carnegie Mellon, but I'm sure there are other universities in the world also where there are people who are very good at computer programming. And so I said, that's it. I am going to try to change, I'm gonna change my research. I am just gonna think, how should you use smartphones to fight pandemics? Because no one has actually ever seriously thought about this before. And the story is over the course of about a year and a half to two years, we ended up inventing a completely new way to fight pandemics. I want to tell you about this, okay? And 
this is not exactly using math in daily life, but if you can see, I, I'm going to be talking about how you use mathematical thinking to solve an actual problem, because in fact, in daily life normally, you might not need as much math, because daily life you can sort of manage. The most interesting place to use math is when you have a problem that you have to solve, a real problem. And you will encounter real problems in your life that you want to solve. I'm telling stories now about how you go about solving, experiences solving, actual problems, and you'll just see like the, the mathematical threads going through everywhere here of how we solve it. All right. And the first part here was even thinking, why do we want to spend a lot of time now working on this? It's because there is a clear answer to why now, because there are smartphones, and there's another clear answer to why us, because, well, I, I work on the network theory, and... We have the computer science people, so this is the place. By the way, I also love innovation. Part of the goal of this talk is also to encourage people to work on innovation too. Innovation is when you see a problem and you don't say, ah, oh. instead you say, that's an opportunity. Whenever there's a problem, there's an opportunity to make a new solution. And that would be great. That would be great for you. That would be great for your society, where you live. That's, what the, that's where the fun is. And whenever you do innovation, you need to be able to answer those two questions. Why, why now? Why us? This, by the way, is a way of thinking that I got from my PhD advisor when we did research. I'm a researcher. Researchers also have to think about how they're aiming their time to work on something. Because you see, when you're in school, if you get a problem on a test, you, uh, have, to, you have to do the problem. The difference between school and, and university classes and real life is in real life, there are so many problems that need to be solved. So many, from mathematical to scientific to societal to whatever. There are so many problems that need to be solved. In real life, the challenge is not to solve a problem, but it is to pick which problem to go and attack hard and solve. This is what I learned from my research advisor. He said, when you're going to work on a problem, a research problem, you can spend years thinking about that same research problem. Therefore, before you start working on the problem, make sure you know how you would explain to somebody else why it's so important. You need to have the introduction written before the rest of the paper, before you even do the problem. You need to know how you'd explain to someone, this is why we care about the result. If you can explain that, then start working on it if that makes sense. So this, this, this is, I'm, sharing, I'm sharing this because in, in your real life, you will also be able to choose what you want to work on. You'll be able to choose what career you want. You'll be able to choose what job you want. These decisions of where do you want to invest one year, two years, 10 years of your life, this actually is quite important. Okay, anyway, so now continuing on to this. Yeah, we ended up inventing a new way to fight pandemics. Let me tell you a bit about it. So first, I need to, and this is also related to how a research talk goes. The next piece of this is actually a research talk. But... Um, in any research talk, you start by first explaining why anyone cares, then you talk about what, what everyone did before, and then you talk about what's new. This is also useful in case you ever give research talks. So first, why anyone cares about fighting pandemics? It's because unfortunately at this point, the entire world has learned that we don't know how to control pandemics. There's only one strategy being used in the entire world to control pandemics. Well, okay, I should say vaccines. That's very important. We make those, right? We make vaccines. We make treatments. Unfortunately, there are diseases out there which don't have vaccines. I'm talking about HIV. And there are also situations where vaccines start to lag behind further evolution of virus. We're sort of seeing this right now. And so, unfortunately, in those situations, the only thing we know is called the strategy, everybody gets sick. This is what is being used right now. Maybe a few weeks ago, there were two strategies being used in the world. One was everybody gets sick. The other was really try to make sure you stop it. Today, there's only one strategy left because the other one gave up, right? What I'm trying to say is that this is a serious thing. We have only one strategy left that we have found that can control, control contagious diseases. Oh boy, that's scary. That is scary. The reason that's scary is because we got lucky with COVID. If you get COVID, there is a chance that you'll die. But it's not like that. There are other diseases out there where if you get it, it's 50-50 and you're out. That's called Ebola. And every year, there's a new strain of Ebola. 
that somehow emerges. The reason we didn't have to worry about it before is because the world didn't used to be as connected. The old, in the old days, Ebola would come out and wipe out the village. And that was it, because it didn't get further. Today, there are motorcycles, buses. It can leak from the village into the city center. Very, very packed city centers. And there are international flights going to New York. Okay, I'm in, I'm in the US, that's why I said New York. But there are probably also international flights going all the way out. Well, not probably, there are going all the way out to this side of the world. This is why we care. It's because, whoa, what are we going to do with that? You see, we need to solve this problem. So then, the next thing, what did everyone else do before? So there are other people, there are other people by the way, who tried to use smartphones to fight pandemics. The way they came up with was uh, apps that would tell you, oh no, last week you were around somebody. Today, that person is sick. So what does the app ask you to do? Stay home, quarantine, right? It says quarantine. Those didn't work so well for various reasons. Uh, I'm not sure how it is in the Philippines, but I'll say in the United States and in Europe, these apps were optional. They were not, enf they were not enforced because the population cares about privacy. And, and in Philippines, was it enforced? Did everyone have to? Not enforced either. Oh, so you're the same. Right. So, so okay, it's optional. By the way, did you guys know you have an app? Like on your, on your Google Android phone, or if you use an iPhone, there's something called exposure notifications that uh, it probably asked you, would you like to turn it on? Has anyone ever noticed this? Yes, yes, yes. I will not ask how many of you said yes. Okay? But like, so, so somehow, basically, everyone was hooked to say, hey, turn this thing on. There's a reason why this didn't work very well. Think about it. What could possibly fail with an app that will be completely optional, no consequences, no enforcement, no rewards, and occasionally it might tell you, too late for you. Could you please inconvenience yourself to save strangers? How could that possibly fail? People just don't do it. That's the sad thing, okay? And by the way, it's like, in this world, people have the need to go to work to earn money sometimes. It's tough, right? Suppose that you have to go to work to earn the money. If it's too late for me already, you know, got a, got a family to feed. It's, it's complicated, it's complicated, right? I'm not trying to say somebody's right and somebody's wrong. I'm just trying to say this is the heart of something called game theory. There's an area of mathematics, actually it's an area of economics now, but it's where people think about the consequences of rules and everyone trying to do the best for themselves, okay? And the problem with this whole system that was created was that from the individual person's point of view, it would inconvenience the individual to help everyone else. Yes, everyone in, in total is better off if you do the right thing, but individually for me, it's not great. So that's unfortunate. That's why it didn't work. Let me tell you what we made. We made something that would tell you, ping, three. Three means that somebody just got sick. That person often spends time with someone, who often spends with someone else, time with someone else, who often spends time with you. What's the three? Why is that three? Yeah, because it's three steps. Does that make sense? You're third in line to get the disease. That's actually what that means, if you think about it in that, in that way. You're third in line to get the disease. Now let's think, what would this do if there was a future lethal outbreak, like Ebola? Optional to do anything with this information. It's optional to do anything with this information. How would people react if they saw on their app, ping, 12? And what if a few weeks later, ping, eight, and then over the next few days, ping, seven, ping, five. Each of these is a new person who just got sick with this 50% lethal disease. You probably don't want to get the disease, okay? 
It's a new person who got sick with every ping. It's not that the person is walking to you. Okay? It's new people getting sick. Ping four. Ping three. Ping three. Ping two. What would the average person do? Stay home. Quarantine. Run away from other people. Right? I mean, by the way, just think of what you would do. Think of what you would actually do if there is this disease. If you get a 50-50 chance, you are dead. It is ping, 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 ping. You probably would decide that you're going to stay home. Now, here's the beautiful part. Why are you staying home? Is it because you just, you just are such a nice person that you don't want to get strangers sick from you? Is that why you're staying home? No, you're staying home because, because you don't want to die. Yeah, 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 you just don't want to die. So we actually invented the first way of controlling pandemics powered by not wanting to die. Human selfishness, really. By the way, there's another way. It's called vaccines. Vaccines also help you not die. But there's a difference between vaccines and what I told you. You know how long it takes to develop a vaccine? Nobody knows. When you have a new disease, nobody knows. Hey, you know how long it takes to roll out this app? Well, actually, it already exists. Did you see what I mean? Like, this idea, on day zero, boom, active. Sort of like a mask. Active on day zero. Right? And so, actually, when I say sort of like a mask, that's why this is exciting. This is a fundamentally new way to reduce the spread of a disease that works in combination with anything else you use. You can do all, the, when you want to control disease, you want all these independent ways of controlling the disease and combine them. And now, suddenly, there's a new one. Why did I say this controls spread of disease? Well, think about it. If somebody gets sick and then mysteriously, the people who spend time with people who spend time with them just like are staying home, how does the disease spread? It reduces because there's less people to spread it to. Did that make sense? Actually, this also is interesting because it provides an alternative to locking down the entire city. If you have 10 cases and you lock down the entire city of 10 million people, I don't know how many people are in your cities, but there are some cities with 10 million people in the world. If you lock down 10 million people because there are 10 cases, you get 9,999,000 or so on people getting kind of fed up after a while. Right? And then they, they revolt and they say, forget it. And, and then you have not 10 cases anymore, but many, many more cases. This thing just makes it so that whoop, mysteriously people disappeared. It's actually far more efficient. Okay. Yeah, that's what they came up with. And actually the interesting thing is in a pandemic that affected 7 billion people worldwide, nobody else thought of this. This is actually why these days I work a lot on thinking. I work on, on helping people learn how to think. Actually, what the world did see, by the way, is they saw 100 copycats of that other app, which would tell you that you already were around somebody else. Uh, the reason, in my sad analysis of the situation, the reason is because there were a lot of people out there who were not actually uh, medical or people who were trying to help with the pandemic. Uh, they, there were a lot of... Uh, business people who saw that there were governments willing to spend millions of dollars on something to control pandemics. And so what's the cheaper thing to do? You copy the other app that exists and you sell it to the government and you make million dollars. That was what was going on. So I'm, I'm just emphasizing this. Like, the, 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 If you think about the way the world works, that is unfortunately what happened. Okay. But it's okay, we did our thing. So, so that's because we, we are just weird people. So we, we went and did our thing. Uh, and it turns out that the next part of the story is how an idea goes from here out. Because, by the way, just to explain how significant this thing is, um, by the end, this even got to the point where somebody from the White House, United States White House, the person in charge of strategy for pandemics, actually reached out to us to discuss this. So I'm explaining this thing is something which ended up going all the way out. But in order to get there, the first steps, those were tough. So now here are the math in daily life of how to get influence out or how to get information out. This is a very useful 
tip for anyone who wants to be a YouTuber or a social media influencer. I don't know if you guys have that kind of uh, aspirations among this audience, okay? But not, this is not only about social media. This is about how getting ideas out, how to get ideas out. So, well, when I got the idea and started trying to get the idea out, the first thing I did is I said, I do have a YouTube channel. My YouTube channel had about 20,000 subscribers. So I talked about it there. But that didn't work. My subscribers are all middle school students. <laughs> Maybe not all, but a large fraction of them are. So that didn't help. OK, then I also posted it on the internet. But that didn't work either, because there were so much people posting on the internet about pandemics. Then I thought, I do, I do know something about newspapers. So I, I reached out to newspaper reporters. But unfortunately, they wouldn't write anything about what we came up with, because they, they didn't feel comfortable posting about something, unless there was a disease expert who said it was a good idea. It's because the people who write the newspaper articles are not disease experts, they're not scientists, so they can't evaluate, they can't decide whether it's good or not. And they looked at me and said, so what's your, what's your background? Are you a famous disease expert? Well, no, uh, I am a math professor. Oh no, that didn't work, so then they didn't publish. So then what do you do? Suppose you find out that they can't, they can't publish anything because you don't have a famous disease expert. What should you do? Find one. Find a famous disease expert. How do you find famous disease expert? Google. Twitter. You just go look. Go look for famous disease experts. So I found some. And I wrote to them. You know, I found some famous disease experts who I don't know. I wrote to them. Uh, most of them didn't reply. One did, which... And the reply was something like, I'm sorry, I have no time to talk to you about your idea. I'm too busy trying to figure out how to stop the pandemic. Okay, by the way, it's not really their fault. Uh, we mathematicians get emails all the time from random people claiming to have a one-page proof of Fermat's last theorem, <laughs> who have no mathematical background whatsoever, some random person. We actually don't read the, the email. Okay, so it's not, it's not my fault. It's not, it's not their fault that they ignored what I, because look, here I am, some random math professor reaches out and says, here's an idea that nobody from the public health community has thought about before. Probably not useful, okay? So then nothing happened there. Okay, so if that doesn't work, then uh, what do you do? I'm, I'm giving you tips, like what do you do? So, so suppose your goal now is you need to get it out there. The, the barrier is the famous disease experts. They are not, it's not that they don't like you. It's not that they think that you're wrong. They just won't talk to you because they don't know that there might be something to talk about. Well, I did say I'm a network theorist. If you go to the business school, they teach networking also. That's a different kind of networking. <laughs> yeah? Network is so funny. In math class, network theory is the things connected to things. Business school is this. And if you go to the uh, computer science department, Totally different kind of network. This is why network theory is so useful. This area of math I work on, actually, it's so useful because the entire world is networks. When I look at the world, I think of networks. Why in the world am I even here? It's because of a network of people that got me here. Networks are a really interesting way to think about the world. Okay, so then I said, I need to get out to other people. Here's what I'll do. I reached out to my scientist friends. who Friends, friends, they were friends. I just thought to, about who are my friends who do science? And I said, uh, you want to chat? I have an idea. Good thing is during the pandemic, if you tell someone, hey, you want to chat? And they're a friend. It's like, oh, what else is there to do? <laughs> or I mean, yeah, yeah, why not? Let's talk. Let's catch up. So, okay. But the good news is that on, uh, the typical scientist, the typical scientist, within five minutes of talking about this idea, they'll get it. And they'll say, oh, yeah, this is actually different from what the whole world's doing. More people should know about this. They wouldn't say it's definitely right. I don't need them to say that. That takes more than five minutes to think about. But the idea that more people should know, that's what I was going for. So then I would always ask them, could you please introduce me to three more people who are your friends, who are also scientists, and encourage them to talk to me for like at least 15 minutes. Why three? Because on average, one of them won't reply. I still need two. You know what happens if every conversation you have leads to two new conversations, and each of those leads to two new conversations? What happens? Exponential growth. I had my own virus. <laughs> right? I just need the R to be bigger than one. 
this is how, if you think about math, this is how you solve a problem, right? It's like, how do I do, what's the problem? The problem is I need to reach saturation through the disease expert community somehow. So I need a natural growth. Okay, this, this actually did a lot of impact because to, to give an idea of the timeline, I started in March 2020 with the idea, oh, smartphones, network theory, pandemics, let's try. June 2020, the idea got gelled of, oh, wait, we have something that could save the world from future lethal pandemics. That's pretty useful. We need to get the idea out there. Spring 2021. By spring 2021, I'd given so many talks that uh, a lot of the scientists knew. I was finding myself invited and speaking at things like a research group meeting at the Harvard School of Public Health. Remember, I'm a pure mathematician. Oh, I'm an applied pure mathematician, right? But uh, we, normally all my research talks, we got faculty here too, normally all my research talks were at pure mathematics conferences. Harvard School of Public Health? Wow, well, I've never been around that place before. I, I, I was invited to give a talk at, um, at, a, at a meeting of, it was, it was an international conference. It was run by IEEE. IEEE is the world's biggest professional society for electrical engineers and computer scientists, that kind of the world, that, that kind of discipline. And it, it, was, it was because this idea is actually new. Okay, so the scientists, it ran around the scientific community. That was good. And as that was happening, I also then realized that I can't stop at scientists. Remember, I was saying, get the idea out. So I was saying, let's get the idea out of one person's head, get it out of the math world, and let's at least get it to the science world. And once you got to the science world and talked to enough of the scientists, you also overheard their conversations and found out that they were complaining that all of us scientists have figured out ideas to do and the politicians don't listen to us. This unfortunately was happening in many, many, many countries around the world because the scientists don't have power. Does that make sense? So, so well, not that does that make sense. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, so, so I won't say does that make sense. I'll say is that true? That is true. They don't have power. So then I was thinking, I need to find a way to get out to governments and maybe to get out to media. If you can get to media and newspapers, that will do something. So I was also talking to governments. Here's what I found when I talked to governments. Turns out that when you talk to a government of a city or a region, oftentimes they would say, it sounds like an interesting idea. It's new, no one's ever done it before. The city is not able to understand whether or not it's really a good idea. So how about you get another city to go first? You know what happens if everywhere you talk, they say, can you get someone else to go first? We mathematicians call that mathematical induction without a base case. <laughs> okay, I can tell there's some math majors in this room. Okay, if you didn't know what that meant, basically another way of thinking of this is it's as if you have a whole nice line of dominoes and there's no one to push the first one over. All of us faculty, that's how we teach mathematical induction, right? So, so that's what was wrong. Doesn't work. So I was like, oh no, I was thinking, what do I do? I keep having the same problem. I need to find some city or region or some place where there's actually a decision maker who knows science, knows math, ideally, powerful and smart. How can I find someone to reach out to? Any ideas? Prime Minister of Singapore. Exactly. So then I looked up his email address and I sent him an email. It didn't work. <laughs> you know what happens when you email the prime minister of a country? They don't see it. It gets into someone else. They, they, usually it gets to somebody. You usually get a response because they want to get elected next time, right? So you usually get a response. But the response is uh, from assistant or secretary, okay? So that didn't work. Oh, no. The response was something like, thank you for your suggestion. The Prime Minister, unfortunately, is uh, too busy to look at your idea. We have passed your idea to the Ministry of Health. By the way, if you ever have people tell you we've passed your thing to some other big ministry of whatever, it may as well be the wastebasket, okay? This is, just, this is just what happens. Okay, so that didn't work. So how can I get through to the Prime Minister of Singapore? Because I need somebody looking at it who actually knows math or like knows how to think. And the person looking at it didn't evaluate that. Well, 
network theory, right? I am here because I'm here here because of this International Math Olympiad because I know some of your International Math Olympiad coaches and former students. So I said, I also know the Singapore International Math Olympiad coaches. The Prime Minister likes math. He's really good at math. Maybe they know each other. So I reached out to the National Math Olympiad coaches of Singapore saying, do you guys know the Prime Minister? <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer was no. And I said, oh, that's too bad. By the way, you guys should probably try getting to know the Prime Minister. You might get more funding. You know, because if, if the person in charge actually loves math and is a math genius, well, then maybe you'll get funding. Pretty interesting thing is, if he did the International Math Olympiad, he probably would have done pretty well, too, at that level. Anyway, so, so, but that didn't work. So then I kept thinking, what else to do? Well, I did learn one thing from here. Prime Minister of Singapore uses social media. So I was following the social media that he was putting up. And to give an idea of how long this ended up taking, again, idea, so it started working March 2020. Got idea June 2020. A lot of scientists knew was uh, spring 2021. Breakthrough, October 2021. There was one night, it was a night for me, it was 1 a.m. on a Saturday morning. That was the night. And I happened to post a comment because I saw that the Prime Minister of Singapore had posted a new Facebook post saying, uh oh, we used to not have much COVID spread in Singapore. It was really well controlled, actually. But now we have the Delta variant and it's actually spreading. So there are new restrictions. There are new restrictions for Singapore. So I thought, maybe, maybe you might be interested now in a way of controlling the disease. So I put a comment on his post, since he had made a post, I put a comment. The comment explained the idea with like, I knew he was mathematically sophisticated, so I explained it with like a bit more sophistication that he would get. Mathematicians can get this quickly because the words are simple uh, from math perspective. I also made sure to mention that I was the quadratic equation guy. Right? Because it's like, uh, I said, I, I did that thing. You, you like that thing. Um, I, I've been thinking about something else now. And then I went to bed because it was 1 a.m. And by the way, if you can tell by this point what I like to work on, I like to work on things that are hard because they're hard. I like to work on the things where you try and you fail with 99% probability. It's okay. Just try 100 times then your chance of success is 1 minus 1 over E. Oh, sorry, so, so, so anyway, so, so, so like, uh, continue. <laughs> well, the, 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 yeah, so, so, so the, the point is, uh, the, the point is, that was a math joke for anyone who knows about this, uh, the, the, the E, the way that E shows up uh, in, in these probabilities. But in any case, the point is, you just, you just try enough times, okay, try 200 times, you'll be in good shape. But as you keep trying these, you have to give it the hardest attempt you can. Give it a good swing. And the chance that it will succeed will be tiny. So then you go to bed and you get up the next day and try again. That's exactly what I did, right? Give it the hardest swing, 1 a.m., bam, go to bed, wake up again. Next morning, I found out, oh boy, it had blown up because he actually had seen it. And he even wrote a very, very short response. Something like, this looks interesting we should get our government technology unit to look into it. And he signed it with his own initials. That's how you know that he saw it, not the assistant. That was a breakthrough. Because you know what happens when the person with the blue verified check mark reacts, <laughs> responds to the comment on their own post. Do you know what happens to that comment? Zhoop. By the morning, there were hundreds of Singaporeans like, who had reacted to it. There was all this discussion about it. It was the, it was the most commented po comment. It was the most commented comment underneath the post. It got so big, I even heard about it from my uncle. <laughs> my uncle still lives in Singapore. My family, my father, my mother, they came to the US like in the 70s, okay? But my uncle is in Singapore. And my uncle sent a message, an email to my dad uh, and some other relatives at that generation, I think. CCing the kids. I, I'm in the kids' generation, right? Uh, telling my dad, my uncle told my dad something like, you know, your son just pitched the prime minister. 
in my family, I'm sort of known as the troublemaker anyway, so that's, that's not news. Uh, but my uncle said, how he knows, is because he said all the WhatsApp groups are talking about it. Like, not all, but like a lot of WhatsApp groups are talking about it. It's because in, in, in Singapore, people use WhatsApp, and there are groups of, of people chatting about different topics and different interests, and he's in some groups which are technical or professionals or entrepreneurs or whatever, and they're talking about this idea. And I, I said, yes, that was the whole point. No, not that, I mean, that, that makes me very happy. Because if you tried to reach out to the prime minister and you heard about it from your uncle, you know what that means? Everyone knows. It's like the echo, the feedback we were just talking about. The echo went all the way around. Actually, that was the breakthrough. Because after that, it got into the national newspaper of Singapore. This is the Straits Times. The Straits Times, as you may know, is a very legitimate newspaper. Legitimate means they don't publish nonsense. That's actually the very important detail. The reason I had been trying so hard to get something like New York Times or Straits Times is because when they ever publish something, they do very deep research. In fact, if you look at the article, it's quite interesting. They asked me a few questions, but most of the article is not Ho Shen Lo said what. That's not what National Newspaper does. Instead, it's, what they did is they went and talked to the disease experts they trust and they found those people to comment on the idea. The good thing is previously, I already had talked to a bunch of those people during the exponential growth phase. That doesn't mean those people are my friends. Science doesn't work that way. But that means that those people knew the idea well enough that when they were asked to comment, they had some reasonable comments. Actually, the article ended up saying exactly what we had hoped for, which is the truth. And what it was was for COVID, this is probably not that useful. COVID, by the way, if you find out that someone has just gotten COVID and this COVID infection is getting closer and closer, it's worrying, but not as worrying as if it was 50% lethal. So the article went on to say, for future diseases, this thing could actually be quite useful. That was the goal. The goal was to make it so that people in the future, when they think about how you control diseases, they will use this idea of telling you a number. Actually, this thing then, it's like sparking the, the, the chain of dominoes. After this happened, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, the Australian National News, they also put out a, a written article about this. That was, that was powered by their, uh, their scientists. They actually had scientists in Australia who were trying to get more people to know about this idea, and then that appeared in ABC News. And around that time, we also managed to then get it into the Washington Post in the United States by getting it into Bloomberg, and that got into Washington Post. And then shortly after, uh, randomly, I got an email from the White House, the person in charge of future pandemics, pandemic strategy. I also managed to get to talk to the people at Apple and Google who are responsible for that little thing that they tell you, do you want to turn on exposure notifications? So their product managers, their product teams also know about this too. So that's the end of that chapter that I worked on. When I say end of the chapter, it basically went all the way to the people who would make decisions or the people who would advise the decisions, people in power. Now people know. And I ended up stopping work on that because we've reached the point where basically, you know, there will be a future lethal pandemic in our lifetimes. It will happen. And you'll probably notice by that time that every app in the world probably will tell you a number just because this is now run around in the scientific community. Like, also, why not tell you a number instead of telling you just, sorry, too late, you were already around. Tell you a number. When you see that on your app in 20 years, made by Philippine government or whoever else made it, and it tells you a number, now you know where that came from. <laughs> that was a year and a half of work, uh, of get the idea, push, 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 push. What's the story? Yeah, the story is this is like, this is using math to solve real problems. And the problems are not just how to control pandemics. The problems are like, how do you get the word out? How do you get to people? Uh, this is how you use like a, a mathematical mindset. You just study good math, learn about how to think. And then when you look at anything in the real world, you don't just go and say, let's try this, see what happens. Let's try this, see what happens. I mean, you know, there's even a very, be very big benefit of you know why it's good if you're trying to reach a very, very famous and busy person on social media to send it at 2 p.m. Saturday their time? 
that's good. 2 p.m. Saturday, their time. I don't know if this is really what it was because I never talked to ask this, but probabilistically, if you're trying to reach a really busy person and you go reach out and comment on social media, 2 p.m. Saturday, you know why that's good? If you want to get through to that person, what's good about 2 p.m. Saturday? Break, break. But usually very busy people, not on break. You're very close, though. If you're trying to get through to the busy person himself, break, 2 p.m. Saturday. Why is that good? The assistant is on break. Yes. I'm not, I mean, I don't know for sure that's what happened in Singapore, but I'm saying statistically, this is the time to reach out. It's when the person whose job is to block the message is on break. I don't know about Prime Minister of Singapore. I just happen to know that in the U.S. it was widely known that for uh, this guy called Donald Trump, if you wanted to get through to Donald Trump, the ideal time to tweet him used to be 3 a.m. because there was nobody else awake to control him at that time. This, <laughs> this, was, this was like widely known in the United States of America. But I'm just explaining like these, these kinds of thought processes. This is how you go and solve problems. Okay, right. Let me close up with, by, by telling you what I'm working on now. And that will give a little preview of what I'll talk about in the next two-hour segment. We'll then switch into Q&A about anything, right? But I'll spend about five to ten minutes first telling you what I work on now, which, and that's because some people don't stay for both sessions, right? And that also is trying to show you this idea of use math to solve real-world problems. You see, after we did this, I said it's fun to think of something that could help save a lot of people in 20 years. But it's also interesting to think about things that can help now. now. So I was looking for other problems to solve, and I decided to go back to education, which is what I cared so much about before. As I said, I'm not a disease expert initially. I was a math guy. I was working on education. So I decided, based on my experience, the important thing, the important skill that we need to teach people is how to think. I decided I want to teach people how to think, how to innovate, and how to come up with a new idea. And specifically, I wanted to do this in math because that's the heart of logic. And I wanted to teach people in math by having them learn that they can come up with ideas themselves. So the way I usually teach my class, again, we'll talk much more about this in the next two-hour session, but the way I always teach my class is I say, hey, here's a question. I know none of you know how to do this question. Can you suggest ideas? Brainstorm. And what I do is I use your ideas to solve the problem. Of course, I know how to solve the problem, but I'm not going to tell you my way. I want to make your way work. All of you, collaborate. We're going to tell ideas. We're going to, we're going to solve it. And what this teaches students is that their ideas work. Instead of me telling you, this is how you do it. Okay? Now, I wanted to scale this up to let every middle school student, like 6th grade, 7th grade student, who's, who's motivated to learn how to think, to be able to do it. But there's a reason why that wasn't widely possible before. It's because there weren't enough people to lead the sessions. This is actually after school, by the way, because in school, people are busy building the user of skills. I needed to have even more teachers and even more coaches to help with after school, and we don't even have enough for in school. So there was a major shortage of people. Well, I came up with a solution. The solution also comes from aligning incentives and game theory. The solution came from solving another problem at the same time. See, because I work with the top math students in the US and in many parts of the world, I saw that there are lots of people who are really, really good at math as high school students and even college students, really good at math. But their fun later in life and success and happiness is limited by the communication skills. When I say limited, they might actually be having a lot of fun, but they don't know how much more they could be doing. It turns out, by the way, I've, I've seen a lot of very talented, very, very skilled people. It turns out that if you have really good math skills, and if you have really, really good communication skills, to the point that you can get anyone interested in your idea, if you have both of those, you win. But when I was in college, we took a math communication class to graduate. The math communication class in every university is to make sure that you're able to explain every step clearly, which is also important. That's the first step. But I'm going second step. I'm saying, I want to have people, not I want to, the people want to have even more. 
So I started a new program. It's a program for high school students. Right now, mostly of, most of them are in America, and college students also, but most of them are high school students in America. And what we do is these are people who are really, really good at math. They can solve any math, any middle school math problem without needing any preparation. They want to be able to get this other skill. So what we do is we hire professional comedians, actors, and actresses to teach them how to be interesting. I thought of this idea because the university that I work at, in Carnegie Mellon University, it's one of the top programs in the US for drama. Most people know us for computer science, but we're also one of the top in drama. If you want to know how could it be that Carnegie Mellon, that Carnegie could be anything around performing arts, just remember, there's a building in New York City. It's also called Carnegie. Carnegie Hall, right? So basically, my university was founded by someone who got rich with technology. He was doing steel making, and he loved performing arts. So in my university, we have both. So I actually got, I brought over talent from that performing arts side to build this, to run this piece. So suddenly, we have this seriously running program where we have actually lots of people who are trying to pick up these, these skills. They're super smart, and they're getting very interesting. And how does it solve the other problem of coaching middle school? Well, suppose you're trying to get good at getting anyone to listen to you. Can you do it just by watching professionals? What do you need to do? Practice. What do you think people who are really good at math are happy to talk about? Math. So then they live stream the best live video math classes ever made for middle school kids. Let me show you what this looks like in practice. And that, then we'll, we'll close up shortly after and go to Q&A. So what this looks like in practice is that when middle school students join a Zoom, they see two high school students talking to each other and talking to them. Oops, that's not the one I wanted. Let me go here. Yeah, they see two high school students talking to each other and talking to them. And it looks and sounds exactly like this. In order to make it sound like this, I will unmute. Let me make sure I have the right thing going through. Yes. Oh, this is interesting. Let me try this. I bet this actually works. I'm going to play this. All right, so let's see if everyone can hear this. This is a one minute video clip of an actual live class that we teach. Minutes later. So, as we were saying, they still meet at the midpoint. That's a great point made by Ayush. That's interesting. The sound is now playing on your Zoom and not in the outside world, because you hear it. So how do you make it so the audience hears it too? We have a new problem. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, this is another problem solving. So oh, 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 I know what's going on. I can do this. I think, wait a second. So that and then, sure now I'm know. seeing this, since they go at the same speed, this, the green yeah, one goes here at the same time, right? the red you one goes there. The zoom. And then 20 you hear it on times 2. It goes to YouTube, and it doesn't go here. That's no fun, because over here is this audience. So in that case, hmm, now we have a sound duplication problem, which is much worse. Because I want to make sure you guys can hear this too. So I will do something where we're, end up, we're going to end up duplicating the sound for the YouTube people, unfortunately. But the people here will be able to hear it. Okay? I'm trying to think what's the optimal way. Yeah, the optimal way involves a cable. Which I didn't bring. Okay. Let me just do it this way. I'm just going to put the mic. I'm going to put the microphone near here, so you guys will hear it. The YouTube people will get a duplicate, unfortunately. But we'll just do this. Max that. And actually, ah, oh, to make it not duplicate, I know what to do. It will not play on the YouTube. Let's do this. Well, maybe it will. Let's see. As we were saying, they still meet at the midpoint. That's a great point. Yeah. That doesn't play. And then, now I'm seeing this. Since they go at the same speed, this, the green one goes here at the same time the red one goes there. And you guys then, hear this? 20 times 2 gives you 41. Because if it takes 20 minutes for green to go here, 
from the first one to the left, right one. At 60 miles per hour, 20 minutes is 20 miles. And then this is also 20 miles, so we get 40 minutes. Awesome. awesome. Oh, 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 I mean, Audrey, do you have anything else to add? I don't know if it's a good solution, but I just... Yeah, it's really good. And one of the better things about that solution is that you actually don't really need to know how fast the trains are traveling. You can just use the symmetry to sort of... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I actually like that you point out symmetry, because symmetry is always cool to see, and I think being able to see it in problems like this makes it more fun and also, like, makes it more elegant, I guess. But, without further ado, Professor Miller, is there another way to do this problem? But I promised you that there would be another way to do this question as well. Did you guys hear any of that sound? Or no? Oh, okay, then that sort of worked. Now let me go and get out of this. Stay muted. I actually know what's going on now, but anyway, it's okay. Let's go here. I want this thing to not play. Yeah, send it there. Okay, right. Oops. Stop. Yeah, okay. So hopefully you guys heard that. Uh, what you just saw is something that usually doesn't happen on a Zoom math class. That's a Zoom math class. People open Zoom, and that is exactly what they see. That is exactly what they interact with. When I was teaching Zoom math class, it's not like that before. Okay? And so you saw a lot of things. You saw like two people dynamically talking. You saw like writing on the blackboard. You saw that whenever anyone says anything, the chats show up in the bottom, just like something called Twitch. Right? That's what we did. And so this whole thing, what we did is we made a way for actual effective teaching over internet. I'll talk about a lot more of that in the, next section, in the next session of the two hours thing. But the thing I want to emphasize here in this group is that what we came up with was a new ecosystem. What's the ecosystem? We need to have people to help to coach. Where are they coming from? The way they're coming from is that there's, there's a lot of people who are actually trying to learn how to get more successful later in life. And this particular skill base, we made the world's only program that caters to people who are really good at math to help those people learn all of these skills. My inspiration to go and find the communications people from performing arts are because about five years ago, I was trying to get more people in America interested in math. I was working with a public relations firm. It was funded by the Overdeck Family Foundation, a major philanthropic organization. And when I was talking to the, uh, the public relations firm, they told me, you, you need a lot of practice. You're no good at talking to normal people. You only know how to talk to math nerds. They didn't call them nerds. They said, you only know how to talk to math people. So they said, you need to take improv comedy classes, improvisational comedy classes. And so I did. I spent a year for taking about four hours a week of improvisational comedy classes five years ago. It changed my life. And that made me get the idea of, let's give that skill to all of these high school uh, math geniuses as well. Why performing arts people? Here's the problem solving part. Why go for actors and actresses? Because I realized if you actually want to get people to be able to be interested in anything you talk about, you should learn from people who are so interesting with their emotions and their faces that they can even get people interested in things that are not true. <laughs> that is the job of an actor or actress. Do you know what I mean? It's not true, but that's, that's, they, can, they can make you interested in anything. Okay, learn from them. Basically, the, 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 take, the take home is like, there are skills in the world, and there are people who have skills that you don't have, and sometimes you think that those skills are not things that you try to get, but actually everything comes together in the end, and if you combine all of these, you get something. Okay, so this is my little a bunch of tour, a tour through a bunch of things that I work on. Of course, we'll have more hours later in the second and third sessions to go deeper into the ramifications of what this is with education and so on. But um, yeah, I, 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 maybe I should say one more thing. Why am I even in the Philippines? I'm in the Philippines because of that last piece. That last piece, we actually now have students, undergraduate students from, and master's students from Philippines who are interns with us on that program. It's because of the fact that what we're doing scales. Oh yeah, fun fact. It's because our classes are all 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. I was trying to figure out where are there people who might be awake and interested in contributing 7 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern. Because for these classes, we've got all kinds of different 
internship positions. Of course, there's people who are on camera, but that one only works if your internet's really fast. And we also have people who are live, but off camera. That's because our way of doing a, a Zoom class is that real time, this is not like back office, this is like real time, right straight, uh, teaching math through, through text, because then that makes up for slower or intermittent internet connections. This is a part of our entire class. Anyway, I'm here because we have internships. And again, it's because I had learned that there are so many interesting, hardworking, capable people that I said, well, if I need to find a place in the world that's looking for internships from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, that's 8 a.m. to noon in Manila. In Manila. That's 8 a.m. To, to noon here in the Philippines. And I said, ah, that's it. This is like math problem solving too, right? So that's, that's also why I'm here. And I should say, if anyone's interested in those, if you're, I get these questions sometimes, how do you apply? Because they can't find the application. That's right, because we only want people who are actually really motivated, so you, it's very hard to find the application. The first step of how you apply is figure out how to apply. But I'll tell you, the way you apply is you find the email address for me, and you send me an email. But you have to find the right one. And what I mean by this is that, I'll just tell you now since you guys are at this talk, but the right email address is, I'm not going to put it on the screen, by the way. Oh, come on, get out of here. Uh, the correct email address is the one which is on my main website. So you can find, there's a potionlow.com. If you go hunting, you can find a contact. And if you send a message, then we can tell you how to apply. But the reason we do this is we don't want like a ton of applications from people who aren't serious. We want people who are actually interested in getting involved in some um, pretty, revolutionary educationary, pretty revolutionary education stuff. OK, but now I want to switch. I talked too long, because we also did a lot of problem solving with the, with the tech. We got about half an hour left. Let's do like some free form Q&A about anything. Right? And then we'll also add more of it into the second and third sessions. OK. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Do you have a microphone, too? Oh, this one should work. Yes. Go for it. It works. Hello, hello. Yeah, OK, cool. All right, so everyone, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, let's all give Dr. Lo a big hand. So, so some words of gratitude. So thank you very much for the live problem-solving session with the audio. <laughs> and also, uh, for your sharing your stories, which are not only amusing and engaging, but really incredi incredibly inspiring. I think everyone will agree. So now we're opening the floor for questions. Is there anyone who would like to get the ball rolling? Ask the first one. They can be about anything, by the way. Yeah. By now you can probably tell I like lots and lots of things. No need to raise your hand, by the way. Just go straight to the microphone stand. Oh, yes. somebody has a hand. Yes, yes, please come, please come, please come. And really, there's no bad questions here. I, I like all different kinds of topics. And if you, tell me, if you start asking something, I can tell you a story about the something. Yeah. <laughs> Inspired by the something. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, by the way, I'm Kurt. I'm a graduate student in this university, uh, studying pure math as well. But uh, I guess my question is, since we're talking about everyday math and all, uh, one of the struggles I find being a math major is making the pure math stuff that doesn't have immediate application interesting to other people, even to other math people. So maybe is there something that you can uh, share about how to make things like uh, appreciating things that doesn't have applications right now that maybe something in the future would be applicable, but not now. Yeah, this is a very important question. Thank you for asking. And especially if you ever write a grant funding proposal, you need to be able to answer this question. So uh, let, me, let me break your question down into a few different audiences to make the, the math interesting too. And these are all important, and they, are, they go from easy to hard. Okay. So the, the first one is you better make sure that the math you're doing is interesting to other specialists in your area. Because if they're not interested, good luck with everyone else. Okay, and the way that oftentimes my advisor taught me this, and I also do this myself, is that if you're going to work on a problem, you should be able to tell a story of why this might have some benefit somehow. And if you're talking to specialists, the benefit can be benefit in math. That is okay. If you're doing pure math, 
Benefiting math is okay. But what does benefiting math mean? Uh, oftentimes when you solve a problem, hopefully the, the method of the solution or the theorem that you're proving, the method of the proof, or the, the theorem statement itself, hopefully that adds some new understanding to something in math. That something could be something related to, related to some of the central main open problems, the main unsolved problems in your area. That's a good way to anchor. Another way to anchor is if they're related to some important areas in other branches of math. I'm going from narrow area of math to like other areas of math. For example, the area of math that I did most of my research in was network theory, but the kinds of things we used is we used probabilistic methods. And so what we were doing had relationships to actually randomized constructions. Like sometimes in, in math you need to show that there is a way to line up a bunch of dots or a, a, a bunch of sets to have certain properties. And it turns out that randomly generating it can sometimes be useful. Okay, and then that's like a general philosophy that really came out about half a century ago, maybe more than half a century ago, that this became a breakthrough. I just told you a story right now of like why a particular research in something about random constructions could be useful. Right? And so that's, that's a piece. And that, that helps you explain to other math people why this is important and how to explain to other specialists this is important. Sometimes an easy way to explain to specialists that it's important is if the kind of... It, apparently the lights think this is important too. But so, so another way to explain that this is important is sometimes to work on problems that there are some famous people who have tried solving them before and didn't succeed. It's like they had some partial progress on, an, on another research paper. So what you'll do is you'll say, see, this other research paper, they got to here, and they said in their concluding remarks that there's some open question, and we have now made progress on that. It helps if the people on the previous paper are somewhat widely known. The more widely known, the better. This is how you go and get some, something significant in your discipline. Now if you want to get something to be interesting to non-mathematicians, well, then you need to maybe be able to tell the general story of why your area of math itself is useful. Because someone outside math won't really know too much about your details. I just tell you I work on network theory. Do you know what I do on network theory? No, it doesn't really matter to you anyway, right? It's just like, if you're not even close to it, networks, oh yeah, maybe those are useful. So make sure you have a good general explanation of why the area of math that you do is useful. Every area of math, by the way, has such a story or else nobody would work on it, right? So it's good to figure that out. If you don't know that, talk to your professor or read the introductions for your professor's papers. Or if your professor is willing, maybe she or he will share their grant proposals with you to look at. My advisor shared, when I was making my first research grant proposal, he showed me his. Uh, and it's not like it's secret or anything. Like the grant proposal doesn't say like, oh, here's my great secret. And anyway, it was an old one. It's just like these, this is the first paragraph is here is why it's interesting. And so I said, oh, that's what you say. You know, like I think my, my, my PhD advisor, his, uh, his one said something like combinatorics. That's the area of math. Of combinatorics includes network theory. He said combinatorics is as old as humanity's uh, humanity's fascination with counting or something like that. I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. You don't use the same sentence, but you, you get the idea, you get the idea. So that's how you can show your area is useful to other people. Now, that helps you get the research funding things. If you want to explain to the real world how that is, that maybe it's a little bit more challenging. But again, this doesn't need to have so much precise detail of your, your thing. I'm basically saying whenever you're interfacing to the next group, what they, the next broader group, all they know about what you do is the even, even more blurry picture. So you don't have to go and think about why your like, very precise algebraic topology or whatever it is, what that has to do to the person on the street, right? The person on the street, then you start telling them about how like math, oh yeah, it helped me think about this thing. Like, like this is like the kind of talk I'm giving here, right? For an average person, this kind of stuff, you can use math to, to, to think about a, a clearer way to understand why the earth is round. I don't know. I don't know if you're a geometer or not. That's just what's in my head right now, this minute. It's like, well, maybe if you want to understand if the earth is round or if the universe, if the universe is flat or round, then it might be useful to add up the angles. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if you guys have taken those classes yet, but that, that's, that, that's like geometry. That's like geometry class of like the Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometry. But I'm just, I'm just trying to say, I just made that up right now, by the way. There's all these different kinds of things that you can use, and you just take advantage of the fact that that person doesn't need TMI, too much information, right? 
That's what we call it, TMI. Do you guys call it TMI also? Yes, yes, you don't need TMI. It's, it's just, you've you got, you got to figure out what is their impression of your stuff anyway. Go so that they can see a little bit, so they feel like they sort of get it, and that's all you do. Did that help? Yes. More questions? And as you can see, they can be about anything, and you also don't have to feel shy. Okay, great. I was told we have a question from one of our online attendees. Wonderful. Yes, hi, I'll be reading the question. Um, as a mathematics teacher, how do you make our learners realize the importance of math in their daily lives? Based on observation and experience, many of our Filipino students, particular, particularly our junior and senior high school students, do not really like mathematics or they find math difficult and extremely challenging. Thank you so much. Okay, so that one, I'll talk a lot more about that one in the next two hours because there's a whole session about mathematics education, right? Uh, as a very brief preview, all I will say is making math interesting in the daily lives. I don't tell people it helps you figure out how much change you get when you buy something. Because a lot of people say, I just pay by card. Or actually, I don't know, if, do you guys have e electronic money by this point? What do you use? Is it a QR code? Cash. Gcash. Gcash, right? Not, not like actually counting the coins. Nobody does that anymore. Like, nobody, nobody counts. Oh, what's that? Oh, you still do sometimes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so, so maybe sometimes. But, but I think what I, what I will also say is, well, in 10 years, nobody will. Because that's the way the whole world is moving. So, so I'm trying to say the, 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 the traditional things of, you know, get how much change. And even when I say count, that's not that deep. <laughs> you don't see your life advancing that much, especially when you're explaining to the high schooler why they're logarithms and sines and cosines help them count how much cash to get back, right? That, that's, that, that's not going to help, right? So the way I usually will talk about that is it just makes you smarter. It just makes you smarter. And we'll talk about more in the next session of how that can help you make, make you smarter. And the thing about how to get people more interested, I'll also talk about that in the next session. But the key idea is you don't have to tell someone that something is useful for them to be interested in it. That's what we learn from the actors and actresses. It doesn't have to be based on useful. You can get people interested in anything just based on how you pitch it. Okay, more questions? Yes. Oh, somebody, yes, yes, yes. Good, good, good. Come, come. Hello, okay. So about your talk earlier, your way of letting students uh, use their ideas to solve problems rather than just you direct them then to tell how to solve it. it reminds me of Lockhart trying to use mathematics as a creative way or you know encouraging students to use mathematics as a creative way to solve problems really reminiscent on that so I've read the Lockhart's Lament several times and I've got to admit every single time I cry <laughs> reading it <laughs> so I want to ask uh, related to that sort of work if you think that mathematics classes especially on math classes on lower levels like high school middle school and the like give a good representation for the student of what mathematics is or what mathematics is about. Yeah, okay, I'll also talk much more about that in the next two hours, but the short answer is it's very difficult to do that at large scale, and that's why you haven't seen it before. We have a new way that actually makes this possible, but still doesn't re replace what's going on in the schools. Because what's going on in the schools is you're still trying to help people get to a certain base. I think what you need is both. I think that's my main point. You need both. Because you need to know how to do the basic things, and you need to also have a space where you can learn how to play. But in the past, there wasn't this space to learn how to play, largely because there was a shortage of resources. And that's why the latest thing that I've worked on solves that resource, resource shortage. Yeah, but we'll talk much more about that in the next two hours. Anything else? Ooh, lots of them. Here comes this person first, and we'll go to you next. Yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Lo. Thank you very much for that presentation earlier. I just uh, you mentioned that you took math communication in your studies before. Could you comment on what that entailed? And the second part of my question is: Should that math communication training be pursued also by? postgraduate and PhD students as they progress through their studies. Thank okay, you. let me be more specific about the things that I did. So first of all, when I was an undergraduate student, college student, it was required for the graduation to take a math communication class. 
In my university where I teach, every major is required to take some communication class, which is a, like a scientific communication or something. But the level that that aims for is to make sure that you are able to explain everything in detail. That has nothing to do with making other people interested in what you're talking about. Both are important, by the way. If you're just very good at making people interested in you and you speak nonsense, that's also useless, right? So that's like the different notions of communication. And by the way, the scientific communication is an art because if you learn what words to use as you explain, your explanation is very clear. That's useful. So I, I'm glad I took that class uh, because eventually if you do academic research, you have to write research papers. Or whatever you do, you have to explain what you do. So, okay, that's important. The other thing that I did, though, was this drama classes. Like just learning how to tell a joke. Or learning what you do when you stand somewhere. Or what you do with your hands, right? Body language. This is stuff that is really, really useful, in my opinion, if you eventually want to do things where you'll be trying to get other people to want to follow your ideas. Which I think is actually generally useful because no matter where you work, at some point in your life, you might come up with an idea that you want the boss to go along with or you want other people to go along with. So that's why I, I encourage everyone to also take performing arts classes. And my piece around there is sometimes people say or they think, yeah, but maybe he can do it, but that's just not my personality. I'm just like not that kind. Look, by the way, when I was in high school, I was a nerd, okay? But so, so that's, that's one thing. But the second thing is um, you don't have to think of personality as something which is baked into you. And here's a way to think of it. There are people in the world whose job is to suddenly flip into a different personality that's not their own. And they do this multiple times a day. Who are these people? Actors, actresses. It's a skill. It's just like how you learn how to do math. That's a skill too. I know plenty of people who are actually highly introverted, who when it's time, they will flip on the, okay, this is, this is my skill. I'm going to use it to do what I need to do to get ahead. They get home and, oh, you know, the done, done. Oh my gosh, that was, that, that was tough. But that, that's just, that's just, you do it because it's really effective, right? And so what I'm trying to say is, don't think to yourself, I'm limited. I can't do that. That's not part of me. You can still be you, but you can learn how to put on the show when the show needs to be put on. And how you do that? You go and learn it from people who do that every single day. Okay, more questions over here. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ponshan Lin. Uh, my name is Jason, and uh, I'm, currently, um, I'm currently employed for the past four years, and um, I used to work in an international organization. So uh, my question to you is this. So one is often when policymakers think of uh, approaches to the current problems that we have, uh, there are some answers in, you know, from scientists and mathematicians, but it, it, there's often like a communication disconnect with them because, as you mentioned, politicians often have like, you know, uh, one minute to read like an email from someone. So uh, I have two questions for you. So one is like, uh, as a practitioner of um, math and science, like, how do you normally reach out to them? And the second thing is like, from the from a policy standpoint, like, how if we if ever we're interested in the research coming from your end, like. What's the best way to get in touch with academics from your end? Okay, I will answer your first question first, and the second one I'll have to ask you to explain a bit more because I don't understand the end of it. But the, I didn't hear clearly the end of it. But the thing about the how to get in touch with the politicians, right, or how to get influence on the politicians. Whenever I work with anyone, I first try to understand what is their motive. I start there. I don't start with what do I deserve. I always start with, what's your motive? What do you really want? How do you advance? And I'll say that sometimes when you find out that the motive of the person is not even really to do the improvement on the area you want, then you say, oh, it's going to be kind of hard to do that. Can I find something that aligns with their motive? Oh, maybe I can do something that makes them look good and they, they can get advanced. I'm just explaining. Like When you want to do anything, think about how you help people advance. And the, na the nature of government is something called bureaucracy. Many different levels, okay? And sometimes if you're stuck in the middle level, you don't even have the freedom to think of, well, the whole country would just be better if we did this, because there's three more levels you've got to convince the person to do, right? So you just realize that, and you realize that when you talk to the person, if you can find a win-win situation, if you can find out what they're trying to do, and you can show that it feeds in, you'll have it. Whenever I'm talking to a person, whether powerful or not, I often start by not talking yet. I, I want to learn about you. 
Actually, this is a general thing. When you are communicating to someone, if you want to communicate your idea to them, do not start by talking. Start by asking them about them. Then you figure out what they're going to be most receptive to, and then you give that. Okay? This is, this is how I've been somewhat you know, successful with some of these things I've reached out to. Another thing about reaching out to, to governments and politicians is the connections, the relationships, the network theory is actually extremely important because they're busy. That's what you just said. And so they need to know that somebody else that they trust says, you should actually talk to this person. So when I go through life, I actually, I'm always thinking of this network that gets built with each person I meet. And I often am noting to self, oh, this person is close to like that location of power or that location of resources funding or that location of uh, skill and talent, right? It's just, I'm always, I'm always like watching this and I have this big map in my head. So whenever I need to do something, it's the, oh, okay, let's see, what's the fastest way to get through towards that person? That's how I usually try to approach this government politicians. And the other thing I'll just say here is um, you have to be very patient too because it's big. You have to be ready to be disappointed because when the government changes, all of the things that you, all the relationships that you had, <laughs> is that now you have new relationships to build. That's the name of the game, right? And that's how it is. The second question. Did that, did that, some, did that kind of answer your first question? Uh, yes, it did. Um, if second I could question. clarify the second part. So for me, like uh, I used to do math, but I ended up majoring in international relations, which is quite a far cry from math. But uh, I think one of the things that I realize is that, again, like it, there's always value in reading what the scientists and the mathematicians are publishing out there because sometimes they do have the solutions that the politicians don't see. But uh, I think my question is, you know, for us who are already in slightly in a world away from math, like what is your best advice for us to continue like cultivating that interest in that field so that we're not blinded by the solutions that we see from our, from our upbringing? and always look at back at the solutions that are coming up from the more technical side of things. Okay, so this is sort of a question of if you did math, you moved to somewhere else, you sort of want to know what's the buzz in math so you can stay plugged in. Mm -hmm. I'll, make a, I'll make a recommendation for a, something called Quanta Magazine. Has anyone heard of this? Quanta Magazine, it's free, right? It's free, that's also good, it's free. It's published by the Simons Foundation. Jim Simons is a mathematician. Actually, he's very, very wealthy. He's probably the most wealthy mathematician. But because what he, what he did is he started a financial firm that does investments called Renaissance Technologies. But he then donates his funds to go and help promote mathematics. And this Quantum magazine publishes very high quality uh, expository explanations of latest things in math. I say expository, they try to make it understandable, not quite to the layman, I'm not sure the layman will fully understand it, but for someone with your background, you would get it, and it would be just like, it's perfect. It's not designed for somebody where you must have a PhD to understand it. It's also not all the way down to the level that you explain it to like a, a primary school kid, right? So it's, it's, it's that. I would say that's an interesting place. That's where I often will find, whenever I see article in Quanta, I know, oh, this is probably some big thing in math that I should know about. And it will be easy enough for me to understand reading it and quite enjoyable at the same time. If you're, if you're trying to find out like the latest things that could be useful for something that you, you, that you work on, this is harder. I don't really know how to get discipline specific type information. On that one, it would just be to have a network of friends. And if the friend tells you something new happened, great. But otherwise, the quanta is probably a good central source. Sure. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, one person is already making his way to the mic stand, and we have an online question, I think. So, oh, so it looks like we'll take this one and then an online question. But thanks. It's come for the afternoon session. We'll have more Q and A. We'll have more Q and A. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, it's not. It's not a secret that you have amazing numerical ability, but I'm just curious. How did you see yourself, or what pushed you to pursue pure mathematics in the first place? When you could, when you could have gone to applied mathematics or physics, like was it? Was this cultivated at such a young age, or did this like grow over time? Okay, so I'm going to give you a weird answer. The answer is that I never was committed to pure mathematics, and I still am not, right? What I was committed to has always been three things. Ever since like middle school, I've been committed to three things. The first is I like people. I like 
talking to people. I like understanding people. I like making people happy. I like the smile that when, when you've done something that has helped them, I like to see that smile. I like to see as many of them as possible, more people, more happy, better. That was the, what, that's my main thing. Second one, I like doing very hard things because it feels good when you get them done. I like them even more if someone tells me that you're not going to be able to succeed. Then it's challenge accepted. Okay? And I like the third one is, I like it when the breakthrough is from some different way of thinking or some creative thing that cracked it. Not just that I did the brute force for so long that it finally worked, it's that, no, that, impo that very difficult thing got cracked because there's a new idea. These are the three things. Okay, what does that have to do with pure math? Well, it turns out pure math is where I got to see a lot of that. Because in pure math, that's where you work on very difficult things, and the crack is like, oh, look at that clever way to do this. It's just very crystalline. It's very clear, right? And then the people I got at the very beginning, and even today, I really enjoy teaching pure math. I mean, I enjoy doing pure math problems. Those were fun to work on. And when I was a high school student, I helped to coach middle school students in pure math, not in physics. I found pure math to be like fun to teach. It's just nice to teach pure math. And then later I became a professor. I was teaching pure math. I love teaching pure math classes. It's fun. Now, uh, along the way, what did I major in? So the story is, I'm not committed only to pure math in that I also do a lot of technology. I didn't even talk about that in this talk. I'll say more in the second talk. But I do a lot of the technology behind the work that we do with our online teaching. I actually write the code. I'm the main software engineer. So when I went to college, originally, I was thinking, OK, I want to study computer science. But for me, financial stuff was relevant. So I chose the university based on which was affordable, most affordable for my family. I got a scholarship from a university. And so I went there. And it turns out that computer science wasn't the major there. So I said, I guess I'm not studying computer science. right? I'll go and do math. Math is a major, so I did math. And then finally, when I graduated, I said, now I'm going to switch my side to computer science, and I applied to some programs. Some of, I won't name which because I don't want to pick on people, but I, I, I named, I, named a, I, went, I found a very famous program that did math and computer science, and mostly computer science. I, I thought, not mostly, but I thought I could use that to switch over. But when I went to visit that university as a prospective PhD student, so I got in already and I went to visit, I, I found that the professors there weren't super interested in talking to me, and that made me a little bit worried of if I go here, Will I get to learn that much? And then I went to visit Princeton. And at Princeton, there was this really interesting professor. His name was Benny Sudikov. He was young. He, was, he didn't have tenure yet. That means that he didn't have a guarantee to stay. By the way, at Princeton, that means you won't be able to stay. Because at Princeton, if you want to be able to stay and get tenure, you need to win the Fields Medal. That's difficult. Okay, so I sort of knew this would be a tough, tough experience, but he was just such an interesting person, a nice person, and it was clear that if you worked with him, he was going to help you. And I said, okay, I'm going to do what you do, because I want to work with you. I'm a people person. I said, if I work with you, I will be fine, because you're going to take care of the students, and I'll just work hard. I'll just work hard. And that was how I got into the pure math, and I loved it, because he cared enough that he could explain to us why we care. It's like there was the question, why do you care about something? Oh, he was so good at explaining why you care, uh, and then I learned all of that from him. I'm telling this story to show that if I chose something else, I'd probably also have been happy. And I want to say this to everyone. There's no, like, you would only be happy if you did this. There are probably lots and lots of things you can do. Your life just happened to put in that way. This is a way of living without regret also, right? It's just you should live your life, choose what th you think can help you go the farthest. And if you end up deciding to do this or doing that because you got opportunity to learn from someone really, really good to help you do that or this or whatever, this or that, you will be successful. And then today I sort of use these math things to finally go back and do all the applied stuff I like to do. Did that help to answer your question? Yep, and the question online. And then we'll close the morning session. Uh, Helene. Hello. Oh. Okay, so this is a question from the online audience. So I am a BS mathematics student who is interested in writing fiction about math students. And I want to get a more general audience interested in math while giving something refreshing for readers who are already math students and mathematicians. What advice can you give me? Ah, 
You want to get a general audience interested in a story that involves mathematicians, math, like math majors, right? The advice I would give is spend time with the kinds of people that you want to read your story. Know your audience, right? So I, again, I don't know the background. I think you said the person is a BS math. Is that right? So if you want, here's the easiest way to think of it. If you want your book to be interesting to people who are not BS math, spend time talking to people who are not BS math, like your target audience. The more you understand your target audience and what they care about in life, the more of those things you will weave in into your story and they will find it interesting. And you can sprinkle little glimpses of this, uh, what is BS math? What are, what, are, what are undergraduates in math actually like? And this is a general thing. I'm saying it in this way because this is not only useful to the person who asks that question. In general, if you want an audience to be interested in what you're doing, you must know the audience. You must actually spend time with the audience. You must live around the audience. You must talk to people there. You must eat what the audience eats. Do you know why I'm here right now? It's because I want to understand the Philippines. Right? That's, that's what I'm trying to say. It's the exact same thing. It's like if I, as soon as I start doing something that has significant additional work with people from a certain zone, a certain background, my first question becomes, okay, so since we're having a lot of people from this background working with us, what do people care about? How do we find what they need, what they want? Make a win-win situation. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So basically my answer is based on Understand your audience, and then you'll answer your own question, because then you can really pitch it directly to them. Thank you. All right, let's all give a little big hand again. Okay, so thank you, everybody, and thank you again, Dr. Lo, for this first session.